Wildlife. It's a common enough term we use to label animals and birds. Sometimes this term includes fish and all living things in nature. As sportsmen, we typically associate wildlife with those species classified as the game we can hunt. Hi, I'm Shane Mahoney. The game we can hunt. We often don't think about what is and is not considered game, or even where the term game came from in the first place. Just as likely, we may not spend much time thinking about how it is that we can hunt and who, if anyone, owns the wildlife that we do hunt. Someone owns wildlife, or do they indeed? Is owns really the right word when we are referring to wild creatures? These are all good questions, considering that man has been hunting wildlife for millennia, and it is our hunting of some species that has helped save all wildlife in North America. It may come as a surprise to some, but wildlife belongs to no individual, but to the people as a whole. In this episode of Boone and Crockett Country, we will explore a vital principle and law of North American conservation that is known as the Public Trust Doctrine. It explains why we still have wildlife with us today and why we still have the opportunity to hunt. Boone and Crockett Country, presented by Leupold, America's Optics Authority. Who does wildlife belong to, and who owns the land where wildlife lives? These are two questions we, as sportsmen, do not commonly think to ask ourselves. But in today's world, we should. With a better understanding of the answers to these two fundamental questions, we will be better prepared to deal with what quite possibly it could be one of the most significant challenges facing the future of our wildlife and hunting. Public access. With the signing of the Treaty of Paris in 1783, Americans inherited a cornucopia of fish, birds and mammals thriving in some of the most pristine habitats on Earth. With this great responsibility came something of a dichotomy. On one hand, the attitude of early Americans was less government, and they shunned anything that resembled old world restrictions like access to natural resources, including wildlife owned by government, royalty, or the wealthy. On the other hand, it did not take long in this land of abundance to recognize that left to their own devices, early Americans did not have the discipline to manage land and wildlife resources for perpetuity. The bounty the first settlers encountered when they came to the New World was beyond comprehension. It was treasure, especially for those who were escaping tyranny to come to a better life. The problem, no one knew how to take care of such riches when they appeared to be an unlimited supply. It never occurred to settlers to set things aside or to protect these wonderful resources. Thus was the conundrum. How do we set down a much different path than the one laid by the European establishment, wherein noblemen owned resources, and yet keep the commoner from wiping out these resources for his own benefit? How would the new country maintain access to the natural riches of America for all its citizenry, yet manage these resources so they would flourish for generations to come? The answer? It all belongs to the public. The idea that natural resources belong to all citizenry was as fundamental to the budding democracy as freedom of speech or religion, but they would need a new roadmap to follow. The pillar of wildlife conservation and management in North America is the public trust doctrine. This principle is anchored by a U.S. Supreme Court decision that upheld the American ideal that wildlife belongs to the public, not government or royalty. This doctrine provides that certain resources are held in trust and that state and federal governments, the trustees, are required to maintain these resources in healthy condition for the public, the beneficiary. The public trust was not a new concept. It was codified back in 528 AD when the Roman Emperor Justinian declared 
By the law of nature, these things are common to all mankind. The air, running water, the sea, and consequently the shores of the sea. In Britain, mankind was replaced with noblemen. The concept that wildlife could be owned by an individual was vehemently opposed by the patriots of the United States. Individual ownership was also a completely foreign concept in the eyes of the Native Americans. Fundamentally, Native Americans believed that they and all living things were part of a whole system and that no individual could lay personal claim to any land or wildlife. Of course, this religion was not shared by the white establishment and was replaced with the notion that wildlife was owned by all citizens of the United States. During the early 19th century, what belonged to the public through the public trust doctrine would be put to the test, the first of which would be a battle over oysters. By right of discovery or conquest per British laws, lands, waters, and the lands under these waters were granted to noblemen by the king. After the American Revolution, the people of each state became themselves sovereign and in that character now held an absolute right to land, waters, and the wildlife living there. In the New World, we didn't want wildlife to be a privilege of royalty. On the other hand, we didn't know how it could be owned or governed. When we wrote the Declaration of Independence, we didn't declare what ownership of wildlife meant. The young federal government couldn't claim ownership, that's just about like having a king claim it. We needed something different. Who owned what in America would be decided by the Supreme Court, and the result would have lasting implication for every American citizen. The commoners of New Jersey began complaining that the livelihood of their families was being threatened by wealthy oystermen who had influence over the local courts to uphold the privatization of coastal and estuary oyster beds from which they had been freely gathering food. Their plight raised the question whether oyster beds, thriving in the estuaries and inlets of the Atlantic coast, should be common holdings or private property. This was the question that riverbed oystermen took to the New Jersey Supreme Court in 1821. To the surprise of both parties, in the landmark case of Arnold versus Mundy, a court of patrician men of wealth ruled for the commoners, and in so doing, upheld the principle of public trust. If the Supreme Court had decided that wildlife would be private property, the precedent would be disastrous for the future of America. Imagine a country where every mountain, every bird, every river, every beach, indeed every living thing was owned by an individual or a corporation. Our traditions of family vacations, weekend, camping or hiking trips, trips to the beach, bird watching would be radically different. Today, the public trust doctrine refers to a common law doctrine creating the legal right of the public to use certain lands and waters and the wildlife living there. Oysters, water rights. While these may not seem to have any relevance to our opportunity to hunt game animals, these court cases paved the way to codify public hunting. Things might have been very different in North America had these court cases leaned toward individual ownership of natural resources, including wildlife, rather than their clear response to establish wildlife as a public trust resource. I have had the opportunity to travel much of Europe and Africa studying their systems of natural resource ownership, use and management. I can honestly tell you that we are truly blessed in North America to have the system we have. In other places, individual ownership of wildlife may not only exclude the majority of citizens from enjoying wild creatures, it often isolates wildlife onto private preserves. Wildlife is therefore less abundant elsewhere and sometimes poorly managed. But democratic access is the basic and most important distinction. For us to be able to purchase a license and go hunting is a very special thing. And now, a closer look with Doug Painter, presented by Leupold, America's Optics Authority. 
Our hunting trivia question for today is where did the term game, which we use to describe wildlife species that are hunted, come from? The use of the word game actually dates back to the late 13th century Europe and the training exercises soldiers of the time used to hone their fighting skills. During peacetime, contests, or sports as they were called, typically involved training exercises while riding a horse or in a horse-drawn chariot. To avoid injuring one another, these sports were held with horse and rider chasing deer and boar with the weapons of the time, the lance or the bow and arrow. The deer and boar in these combat simulations were called game. So now you know. While the word game transferred from Europe to the New World, the concept of who owned the game did not. And that's really what the public trust doctrine is all about. The public trust doctrine was not an instant and unanimous success. Many people were still not accustomed to something that lives out in the woods or far off in another state as belonging to them and being in their care, even less so to those who did not hunt or fish. Bison being slaughtered by the thousands and poachers running rampant in faraway Yellowstone Park did spark much interest among Easterners with little sense of responsibility, the need to conserve and protect wildlife was off to a slow start. This changed when Theodore Roosevelt, America's first conservation-minded president, took office in 1901. One of the primary goals of his administration was convincing Americans that the responsibility of owning wildlife and access to that wildlife was not to be taken lightly. In fact, in Roosevelt's opinion, it was a responsibility of citizenship to conserve and protect for future generations. He further insisted that there must be laws put in place to put restrictions on fish and game that was taken. This was not a popular concept at first, but two developments helped steer the tide of public opinion toward conservation. In addition to co-founding the Boone and Crockett Club with Roosevelt in 1887, George Bird Grinnell was also editor of Forest and Stream magazine. Through his writings, this national sporting periodical, Grinnell exposed the abuses of natural resources and wildlife, awakening the American sportsmen and the public at large. Grinnell is credited with stirring the public mind behind America's cherished Yellowstone National Park, which was being plundered by mining, timber, and commercial marketing hunting interests. For the first time, the public came to the realization that they owned a national park, and they were determined to keep it pristine. The public outcry raised from Grinnell's writings was so great, it reached the halls of Congress, and legislation proposed by the Boone and Crockett Club to expand and protect the park passed with ease. Further public engagement resulted from a taxidermy display that opened at Bronx Zoo in New York City in 1922. William T. Hornaday and other members of the Boone and Crockett Club established the National Collection of Heads and Horns. The inscription over the entrance to the exhibit read, in memory of the vanishing big game of the world. The display marked a public interest in the plight of big game animals, which further put conservation and public stewardship on the minds of more citizens than just sportsmen. With public support for conservation growing, the next step was to design a management model that upheld the public trust doctrine, generated enough revenue to maintain and enhance habitats and wildlife, and would be accepted by consumptive users of wildlife and embraced by the public at large. Wildlife policy in North America evolved from one that viewed wildlife as a commodity to be consumed often for profit, to one recognized to the need to conserve wildlife as a public trust. This evolution is embodied in seven principles that have become known as the North American model of wildlife conservation. As sportsmen, we know who pays for most of the wildlife conservation and management efforts in North America. Although the taxes we pay on our sporting arms, ammunitions, and fishing tackle, as well as license and tag fees are derived from the pursuit of game species, 
under the public trust, non-game species benefit as well. It is this user pay public benefit model that makes the public trust unique to this continent. Unfortunately, the majority of people have never heard of the public trust or the North American model and how it is that we still have wildlife in abundance. The abundance of wildlife we enjoy today is often taken for granted. Citizens of the U.S. and Canada have come to expect that wildlife have been and always will be abundant because they're part of nature. Unfortunately, too many of these people don't understand the heroic efforts it took to restore and maintain these populations. The public trust doctrine is a rock-solid, legally recognized concept that has benefited the people for over 150 years. Yet it is not impervious to threat. Make no mistake, land and wildlife are in demand. These two resources themselves are not unique to North America. There is a big piece of the equation that is not under the blanket of protection provided by this doctrine, that is private land and wildlife resources living on private land. The real question we face today is publicly owned wildlife on private lands and who has rightful access to that wildlife. States manage these wildlife for us. The landowners have the right to say who, when, and how much. In the past, access wasn't a problem. Most landowners, especially ranchers and farmers, are fine with people hunting and fishing on their property, but you must ask them and you must treat the property with respect. The bottom line is, population growth and other activities that consume open spaces are shrinking quality habitats where wildlife live. In addition, 60% of all land is privately owned, and this land is becoming increasingly popular to game species and to hunters who want access to them. The public trust doctrine is a foundation we can't afford to take for granted. We can't just assume that it will hold up in an era of energy development, population growth, and other changes that we're going to see in the coming decades. If we hope to protect wildlife, we must take action to safeguard them. We must understand the policies, laws, and principles that collectively work hand in hand with public ownership of wildlife. There are no simple answers. On one hand, we must remove any barriers that block public access to public land, and on the other, find incentives for private landowners to open their land to hunting and fishing. One big step in the right direction was the recent proposal of new federal legislation. Currently, 35 million acres of BLM and national forest land have inadequate hunter access. If made law, the Making Public Lands Public Act would improve this access. Another is $7.5 million earmarked in the Department of the Interior's 2013 budget to allow the BLM and Forest Service to acquire rights of way and other land interests to improve hunter access to landlocked federal lands. As we have learned, North America is unique in that wildlife resources belong to the people, not government, royalty, or wealthy individuals. The public trust is what saved wildlife in North America because people have a vested interest in the wildlife resource and in securing their own future access to this wildlife. We cannot afford to take this for granted. Today, access is the key. When and where hunting and fishing happens, conservation happens. Therefore, we also cannot afford to ignore those things that limit public access. Work is underway to lift the barriers that block access to public lands. That's the good news. Finding the right incentives that will open more private land to hunting and fishing is an even bigger challenge. We must find a way to strike the right balance between public wildlife living on private land having a value to landowners to encourage them to properly manage this wildlife, while at the same time ensuring public access to what is, by law, a public resource. In time, we hope to do so. 
Thank you for watching. I'm Shane Mahoney.